So we have an interesting situation. It's day 19, and the Biden administration is literally telling Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister, don't do it, BB. Don't do it. Don't you dare go and start the ground operation in Gaza. Wait. So why are they telling him that? What's going on? I'll explain that in a second. But first, I have to update some important news. Qatar just let us know they have a massive progress potentially with the hostages. So we got more than 200 hostages held by Hamas. That's on top of the 1,400 people they've murdered in the homes on October 7th. So they also took over 200 hostages, mostly civilians. So the Qataris are now saying, look, we have a progress in letting some, maybe all, maybe little of them out, unclear exactly what's going on. But the clarification to this that came from the Israeli side was mind-blowing because the Israeli chief of the Security Council uh, basically said, hey, we appreciate what the Qataris are doing and they're critical in the current efforts to release hostages. So the Israelis are saying on their side that Qatar is actually playing a very crucial part in the release of the hostages. Now, I want to clarify, look, Qatar is a very chaotic member of this. They're really good at playing every single side. They're the best friends of the US. They have a massive base over there. They're the best friends of Iran. They're really good friends with Hamas. They're really good friends with everybody. And now they're the mediator in this. So they've played both sides for a long time. And I've called them the agent of chaos a little bit because they fund a lot of extremists and a lot of terrorists. It's a known fact, but they seem to be doing their job at least here. The relationships that they've gathered from all sides actually put them in a position where they're the best mediator to get this done. So at least for now, they're playing a positive part in this. But that's not even the craziest update we have today because the Turkish chief, Erdogan, just came out and said, look, Hamas is not a terrorist organization. It's a freedom fighting organization. And Turkey owes nothing to Israel. Literally his words. This, if you're looking for potential World War III development, Turkey is starting to take a side in this. Even though Turkey is a member of NATO, and a very natural ally to the U.S. and the U.K. and France. They're drifting closer to the U kind of the Iranian, the Russian, and the Chinese side. And these kind of statements kind of make things a little bit more complicated and make the theories of a potential clash of a regional or even a global capacity more likely. When Erdogan is saying these things, is picking a side, and it's a very dangerous development. And if you thought that was the craziest thing, that's not. The Secretary General of the U.N., uh, Gutierrez, I actually said yesterday that what Hamas did didn't happen in a vacuum. Essentially, kind of justifying what Hamas did in the eyes of the Israelis. So there were two camps out of the statement. One camp was basically saying, well, Gutierrez is speaking the truth. The Hamas and the Palestinians are being oppressed for 75 years. On the other hand, the Israelis and whoever supports the Israeli side is saying, well, look, he just justified the murder of 1,400 civilians, saying that they had it coming. So a whole kerfuffle started. Half the people hate him, half the people love him. I personally think he's an idiot for saying that because that's a really bad statement for a UN chief to say. Eventually he had to pivot out of this and basically say, no, 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 I wasn't justifying that. That was a horrible. So he did a 180 and kind of retracted this. But that was a stupid statement to make because it's such a controversial topic. Why would you take a side in this if it's seemingly? That's not a, you know, just makes me think like, look, if this is the chief of the UN, this is the kind of decision making you had. Anyways, uh, what also happened in the UN is that the Israeli convoy actually played a phone call of a Hamas terrorist calling his dad saying, hey, dad, I just murdered 10 Israelis with my bare hands. And I took the phone of the woman I just murdered and I used her WhatsApp to send you all the picture of all of them dead. And the family's like, yeah, son, you're the best. May Allah be with you. And they're cheering him on and absolute insanity. I mean, I do all Palestinians uh, support Hamas? I don't think so, but is there a big part who supports what happened on October 7th? It seems like it. In any ways, uh, the, C the CNN report that came out a little bit later got even crazier because now the CNN report that we just saw says that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu who was told by the Biden officials to use his head and not his heart. Essentially, do not go into a ground operation right now. Now, I'll explain in a second what they meant by that, but let's move on a little bit here. So if you're looking for a cause of the delay of the ground operation, it's coming from the U.S. side. Now, the head of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, met with the PAJ and the Hamas leaders in Lebanon, which shows you again that things are heating up. The new fronts that are being created with the whole new regional conflict that's brewing up, it's actually heating up. Whether they met as a show of force or they have intent, I don't know. But do they have capability? Yes. Hezbollah has capability. I don't know about their intent, but the capability is there. 
hundreds of thousands of rockets, tens of thousands of combatants. They're a very dangerous organization. And if another front opens up, it's going to be a big thing. On the positive side, the Ethiopian Airlines are the first company to resume flights to Israel of the companies who left, and that happened today. Uh, yesterday, the IDF killed 10 terrorists to try to enter Israel from the sea, uh, which was absolutely insane. Um, again, they keep on coming, I guess. Uh, the Jordanian queen came out on TV and said yesterday, well, we have no evidence that there were 40 beheaded babies, etc., etc., etc. I just want to explain about her. She's Palestinian. She's married to the king of Jordan, who's not a Palestinian. He's a Hashemite. Now, Hashemites are a minority in Jordan. The majority of Jordanians, the vast majority, are Palestinians. It's a powder keg waiting to explode. So the only thing keeping Jordan together is the ability of the king and his minority to keep a lid on this craziness. So when she comes out and says this to appease the majority of the country, which are like 70% Palestinians, that's a political play. So she knows what she's doing, but you know, don't buy the hype. So IDF resumes strikes in Syria and Lebanon, uh, killing about 40 Hezbollah uh, terrorists so far, or 40 freedom fighters, whatever the f you want to call them, I don't care. So uh, Hezbollah is taking a lot of casualties in this as they're trying to show solidarity with Hamas, but not start a new front. So far, it's been working, but this is a very dangerous game for both sides. Now, the most important piece of the news that came out today, and the most interesting one, is that former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak came out and said today that he wants a, to suggest a new solution, which is an Arab peacekeeping force that will come into Gaza right now, stop hostilities, disarm Hamas, take over until the Palestinian Authority comes in and takes over Gaza. Ehud Barak actually was the guy who pulled Israel out of Lebanon in 2000. Israel used to hold the south of Lebanon as a security strip. Barak left it, and now we got Hezbollah sitting on the border of Israel with hundreds of thousands of rockets and you know tens of thousands of fighters literally threatening to demolish Israel. Uh, he also left Gaza. He left Gaza, and then uh, now Israel has Hamastan on its borders. These terrorists who are basically killing them and shooting rockets at them. That's another Barak creation. So Barak basically is a peaceful guy, and he always seems to try and negotiate with these people, uh, with the Hezbollah and the, the Hamas, and, and he gives them territories and tries to find a peaceful solution. But in all his previous solutions, he got screwed. And you can see it in the hindsight of history. By the way, he also offered the Palestinians, that's a crazy thing, he offered the Palestinians in 2000 100% uh, of Gaza and 93% of the West Bank in order for them to have a Palestinian state, and they said no because they wanted 100% from the river to the sea, that all fantasy of making Israel disappear. For Hamas, you have to understand, as any geopolitical analyst will tell you, Hamas is playing a zero-sum game. For Hamas, it's either the whole Israel gets wiped out and it's a Palestinian state or nothing. Hamas isn't looking for compromise. So how would you make a ceasefire with Hamas if you're Israel? I mean, they're not looking for a compromise. They're not looking for half of Israel. They want 100% of it, from the river to the sea. So. What kind of compromise can Israel get there, especially when there's no trust with Hamas? They're in a very, very complicated state. So if they leave Hamas there and they don't go into ground operation, they prevent a regional war, but then they get to live next to Hamas, which proved the ability, capability, and intent to kill them. If they go to the ground war and they try to destroy Hamas, they're going to pay a lot of casualties on the ground because the tunnels and all this craziness, and they may start a regional war that may start World War III. Both are really horrible choices. It's kind of a catch-22. Maybe you should get a solution. Let me know in the comments below. Would love to hear that. See you in the next video.